Welcome to The Radical. I'm Nick Terzo. Obviously, this podcast being called The Radical has become quite the proposition after the events in our nation's capital in early January. It actually made us have to recut the show opening and how we ease you into each episode as a listener. The mere mention of overthrowing governments has lost all humor and jest. So having said that, on to this week's show, which is a real master class. If you are an artist or a songwriter, you'll truly appreciate my guest this week. Not only was he a co-writer and producer of a groundbreaking song that may well have contributed to kicking off a couple of genres, but his reputation is definitely sealed as a producer of many of the most seminal records of the 90s and early aughts. Think along the lines of the Red Hot Chili Peppers' Mother's Milk, Soul Asylum's Grave Dancers Union, Soundgarden's Super Unknown, Hole's Celebrity Skin, and Marilyn Manson's Mechanical Animals. Grammy-nominated producer Michael Beinhorn and I go deep, starting with Herbie Hancock's groundbreaking hit, Rocket. No formalities here. Michael and I get right into chopping it up about his stellar career. Up next, my conversation with Uber producer, Michael Beinhorn. These are really interesting times. When I had my family off and I took them to Amsterdam for a few days, and you know, my, my son went to bed, my wife went in the room with him to help him go to sleep. I went in a separate room. I turned on my computer and my and a portable DAC that I had with me in my headphones, and I started producing a project with a band in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking great. It's amazing. It's it's incredible. I mean, the things that you can do, and these are guys who got no money, but they don't have to fly me out to where they are. They don't have to have me sitting around and feeding me in their little barn, <laughs> which is where they're cutting, they were cutting their record, you know, and, and putting me up and basically paying for my time. I'm there with them for a couple of hours in an evening, helping them, you know, help helping them go through this. The time allotment is completely different and it's proportional to what people can afford and what they, how much, how much of my time they really are going to need. Your manager wouldn't have taken their calls before. So <laughs> they would never have gotten to you in the old days. <laughs> so <laughs> My manager's assistant wouldn't have taken their calls. <laughs> it, it, would, it would never have happened, but because the technology exists now and because the need is there, because there actually is a massive, like a field of talented people out there who have absolutely no resource to be able to do, to be able to create beyond what they can do themselves in their bedroom, let's say, and no way to be able to kind of, to get, to get it to the outside world beyond the obvious sources. You have so much potential out there. Right. It's easy to sit around and, and, and piss and moan about how bad music is now. And granted, there, there's some real crap out there. There's no question about that. And that's not, that's, not an old, that's not an old guy talking either. I've got a 26-year-old daughter, and she says the same thing to me. And she, she knows more music than I do at this point. Like, her, her knowledge of music far outstrips mine. And she's still making the same complaints that people who are, like, my age are making. You know, I hear so much of this now, you know, we have the opportunity to do something about that, to really put our money where our mouth is. If we don't like it, to change the situation and do something better. That, to me, that's my gig. That's what I'm doing now. And just so I note here, we are recording now because I didn't want to miss where you were going with that because I knew it was going to lead somewhere. I hadn't had that button pushed and I didn't tell <gasps> you. Are, so I'm telling recording. you, we're recording. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, you, you caught it, you're wise enough. Oh, no, no. There's a red light up in the upper right corner. I, <laughs> thank you. But the reason I wanted to have you is, you know, I've always thought you were kind of, and I never got the opportunity to work with you in the studio, unfortunately. Um, but I always thought you were the most thoughtful, one of the most thoughtful guys ever. Um, and your dedication to getting it right. Um, I think there were very few guys that 
were as dedicated as you were. You were just all in when you did these things. Um, and, and look, some of the artists you work with, I understand why. Um, <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of why I wanted to have you on the show, because I do think you're definitely one of the most thoughtful producers I ever ran across, even though you and yeah, I never yeah. found a project to kind of do together. Um, and let's talk a little bit about like early life. So you're in New York, you have a band called Material. Is that right? And that's with Bill Aswell. So two geniuses in one band. That's right. Yeah. Um, what that's what right, was that yeah. experience like? <laughs> oh man. I mean, <laughs> it was, uh, well, it was formative, crazy. Um, it was, um, I mean, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't very healthy. <laughs> In what way? Um, In what way do you mean, I mean that? I, I mean, I, I was pretty unstable and, and Bill is kind of like a Svengali type guy. Um, he liked to surround himself with a lot of people who would be more subordinate. Um, you know, so a lot of people, er, everyone in material, for, for the most part, you know, we're, we're all younger than him. And I think a lot more malleable uh, and the times that, they were closer in age and less malleable. They were, they didn't stay very long, <laughs> but it was a crash course in, in, in doing this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, getting started, like it, I, I was, I was very insecure um, little kid growing up and I got thrust into co-producing records very fast. Um, needless to say, my bedside manner was uh, not, um, <laughs> It's, it, it wasn't what I think a person would want to pay for if they're hiring a producer. I just did not know how to talk to people <laughs> at all. But, you know, we had amazing, with, within five years, we had a, a huge success with um, Rocket by Herbie Hancock. So crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, that just it, it came out of the, out of the ether. <laughs> And Ed won a Grammy for like what best R and B that year for song or best R and B instrumental. Yeah, it was up for a best instrumental performance. We got beat out by Flashdance. <laughs> <laughs> that was the great. That was actually that was the award that I was nominated for. I wasn't nominated in the R and B instrumental category. Okay, you know, so uh, the Grammy eluded me, but the nomination didn't. You know, but all of a sudden, like we go, I, I go from like living on the street essentially to getting voted with bill as like the um rolling stones like top of their critics poll for best producers in 1983 just on that one song and i was like i i, I didn't know how to, how to deal with that <laughs> I, I had nowhere to put that so um i mean that essentially like send you on your path and say, look, I'm not going to be an artist. This looks like this works pretty well. I'll do this. I was never going to be an artist. It's mm. just, it, it's, it's not for me. I mean, well, I should say I, I never, I, I was never going to be an artist in the, I'm making a record, you know, check out my, my hot riffs um, kind of category. <laughs> 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 my blazing hot riffs. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh it was you know I, I i like this i like this role i like being in the supportive position better i don't i can't really explain to you why i'm sure it's some kind of psychological deficiency on my part i i love this work i love working with other people i i feel that there are people who are far more talented than i am and being able to support them on their journey is one of the greatest joys that i have ever experienced in my life being part of that whole thing being in a recording studio with a guy like Chris Cornell and piecing together a vocal that he did for a song that eventually winds up being life changing for, for some people. It, it's indescribable. I mean, I, I'm sure that you've spoken to plenty of other people who have echoed that sentiment, but it's, you know, I, I can remember those feelings. I can remember those sensations. I think they're going to stay with me until the you know last moment I'm alive, you know? Right. Cause even as an A&R guy, you know, you got that viscerally. Um, mm, yeah. You know, you were around the studio enough to get that also as you went along. Mm -hmm. um, so I share that with you. Um, and in that Chris Cornell, I mean, you, you're talking about Black Hole Sun primarily when that kind of came yeah, together. The whole, I mean, obviously the, enti the entire record had moments like those. 
Uh, I love that man. I'm so sad he's not here. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's still it's it's still one of those things um, where some some days I'll be like, wow, I can't I can't believe this guy's still not in the world. Like the fact that that happened at all is just it's it's kind of beyond me. My Seattle experience had a lot of that in it. It's just been a oh yeah. What was that like? You know, look, you started with Andy Wood, right, from Mother Love. Oh, Home. God. Wait, were you, you were involved in that project? Yeah, I was at ASCAP at the time. So they didn't really know anyone in L.A., Susan mm-hmm. really even, or Kelly Curtis. So I kind of started circulating their demos for them. Um, oh, they got them that. their deal. Yeah, yeah. So... I loved Andy Wood. He was just such oh, a such an man. amazing a, guy. So oh, what a, I spoke with him on the phone once because we were talking about making that record. Um, they, we, I, I've been speaking to them for months actually, and I, I was so bummed not to work with them. But even, even more than that, I, I was just so just, I, I, I couldn't have been utterly distraught. But I was in shock. When I found out that he passed, he, I, I, I firmly believe that the world would be a slightly different place if Andy Wood hadn't had no deed. I think, slightly different, but I, th- I think you're right. He would have tilted the axis a little bit. So he was um, going to make his mark for sure. I mean, he was he he, he seemed like he was going to be the Mark Bolan of the '90s. Yeah. Yeah. So from, you know, from Andy to Kurt to, uh, you know, to Lane in the end, you know, a very long. Yeah. You know, I just it just was deep for me up there. I mean, everyone kind of suscept was susceptible to this addiction. It was sad. It's been sad. Yeah. So. Um, so what album really like as a producer after Rocket, you're kind of the hot guy on the street. Uh, no, actually, I wasn't. So you weren't the hot guy on the street. <laughs> what came no, next after, for you then? <laughs> after Rocket, what happened was I got um, within, after Rocket came out, within about like less than a year, I was booted out of material. Um, you know, because I, 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 I don't think that Bill wanted to share um, the spotlight at that point. And he kind of, he sort of took over the reins. And that's when I really found out that my name on the street wasn't worth that. And like, you know, 25 cents or something could, could have gotten me on the bus. You know, that was about it. So I was put in the position of having to, I guess, introduce myself to the A&R community at large and knock on doors. And being as insecure as I was at that point, having never had to do anything like that, I was so intimidated. You know, I mean, imagine some some little 24-year-old kid coming <laughs> to your, your office saying, I did this record, you know, shaking, you know, I, I'm with, the, uh, can you give me a job, please? <laughs> and uh, you're not going to, wait, you want me, <laughs> you want me to put my faith in you, you know, you scared little kid to produce my artist. You and these were like quarter nice million person. dollars slugs back then, right? This wasn't like going in and giving you 10 grand yeah. to go make a record. So No, no, not like now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah back then there was real money. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was just, I basically hit the streets for like three years. Um, and it was tough, you know. Um, and I, I did... In that time, I did one or two gigs, so I was pretty. I was struggling pretty hard, and you know, most people at that point had identified Bill with Rocket anyway, so it helped. But it really wasn't that great. So, in 1986, I I went to EMI and met with um, Michael. Oh, I can't remember the guy's name. Um, anyway, he said, okay, you know, I may have an artist for you. I've got this band. No one knows what to do with them called the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> and, you know, I, and I obviously jumped at the chance. And, you know, I heard their demos. They were just atrocious. And it turned out I was up against um, 
Mick Jones from The Clash. Like he was the other guy who was up to do the record. And I went to meet the Chili Peppers in New Orleans. The first time I saw them play was in a club called Tipitina's, which I'm sure yep. you're familiar with. And I got in a van with them and drove all the way to Dallas where their next gig was and hung out. And that's how I wound up working with them. Wow. <laughs> and well, that worked. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the artists to kind of in your repertoire, you know, because I, I was having this chat with a friend and I was thinking, why do producers who kind of produce seminal records, the real commercial breakthroughs, you know, that were a combination of both? like really good art and commercially successful and viable. Why are they never on the next one? Um, and so he said he did a little research on it and he said like he found that like 85% of the producers never returned for the record after the breakthrough record or the seminal record that they did. Oh, wow. That's interesting. And I, I didn't thought, know that. how weird. And I couldn't understand if it was more from your perspective, like, you know, I, you guys are lazy. You're not getting the material to where it should be for this next one. And I'm out of here. I can't, I can't. We did just did a masterpiece and I can't come back for something that's subpar now or, or, <laughs> or what that is, you know, is it the dynamic with the band where you just, don't, they don't want you back in the studio again. They want to own all the success themselves. What is it? I wonder. Well, I can, I can speak to that. Like in the case of the Chili Peppers, I actually did two records. I did the yes. Uplift Mofo Party Plan and then we did Mother's Milk. After up, Uplift, they kind of, we sort of had a bond. Like I was kind of part of the family and they weren't, they weren't even looking at anyone else to make the next record. Um, between the time that both record, that the one came out and the other one be, went into production, a lot of stuff happened. The guy in the band died. Um, they went through various personnel changes. There was a tremendous amount of upheaval, you know, and we finally, we finally selected the, you know, two guys who are, who are obviously have been core members in the band ever since with the, I'm um, obviously for Shanti's been in and out, but as far as I'm concerned, the chili peppers aren't the chili peppers without John. Um, Cause he's kind of, to me, like the, with the chili peppers, the, 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 the point of like pivot is always who the guitarist is because I, I, I don't really think of those guys as being songwriters. Um, I, it, they're an amazing band. There's no question, but without someone who can actually compose, um, there, it, it's just not the same thing. And John is as time and history have proven a, a master songwriter. Like he's just, and, and he, he fit them perfectly. And it's amazing because he joined the band when he was 17, you know, so he was, he joined his favorite band in the entire world. He was groomed into being, part of that whole nucleus. So it's like, it can't, I don't think it can function now without him or at least function it, it optimally, you know? So yeah, also there'd been a lot of drug issues in the band, you know, with Anthony. I mean, he and I had had prior, I guess, um, problems on, on the first record because of that. I mean, I was very involved in, uh, in his own, in his personal struggles and things like that. And while I, obviously I think my involvement was very, very crucial to him even being alive at this point, uh, it left, it, it didn't leave the best taste in his mouth because there was, a, it, there was so much tension in there and it was really, really awful at times. And I think I took on the role of being a very parental figure in his life. So we started making the, the next record. There was a little, there was more animosity there. And at the end of the project, I mean, there was, there was a lot of friction between Anthony and Flea when they made that, when they made Mother's Milk, you know, so they, they wouldn't show up for the, in the studio for like weeks. You know, so it would just be me and the engineer and whoever we were recording, which was mainly John doing overdubs at that point. And, uh, you know, by the end of the record, I think my relationship with Anthony had soured so much that it just it just wasn't going to happen again. I mean, I was I, I was sad about it because I was I felt at that point that I'd help these guys not only come out of their hole, but essentially ascend to stardom. But, 
you know, they, they had to do what they had to do. And I, I think that they made the right choice because obviously their records have done incredibly well after that point, you know, and I, and I'm really happy for them. They, everything that they've gotten, they deserve as far as, as far as other recordings that I've done. Uh, it's amazing because with a lot of these artists, I was actually kind of like getting them at a peak point in their career or at a point in their career where the only place that they could go is up or the only, well, I should say the only place they should go is up because they could have always made the, the choice <laughs> at that point to basically say, you know what, this is good enough for me. I feel like failing now for all, you know, for the rest of my career. Uh, you know, so when you're handed raw material like that, this is my perspective on it anyway. When you're handed raw material like that, if you don't optimize it to the fullest extent that you can, you're not doing your job. You're letting yourself down. And equally as important, and maybe in some ways more so, you're letting the artist who's entrusted their entire life and their career to you down as well. And to me, Again, my my feeling that's unforgivable. Like you, you shouldn't even be referring to yourself as a producer if that's the attitude you're going to take, unless you're willing to commit yourself, mind, body, and soul, to the to the task at hand. There's no point. There's no point. It's like it's not just a gig, and that's what it's always felt like for me. But so when you were talking about, you know, commitment and being all in before, yeah, absolutely. But those things to me are like a sacred trust. It's not something that you can take lightly. Like I would never look at this and go, okay, this is my timetable, you know, three months for this done now on to the next boom, 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 knock them all out. You know, they're like, they're, they're bowling pins in a, in a, in a bowling alley or something like that. Like it's like, it's, it's, it's just this rote thing for me. It's always like the record's done when it's done and it's done when we all say it's done when we feel it's right, because that's when it resonates with us. Because when you make a piece of music, the, key, the, the main point of it is that it's communication. It's a personal expression, but it's also communication. It's very refined for a way of speaking to people, you know, but you have to infuse it with something. You have to fill it up with something. If it's an empty vessel, like a lot of people, a music that people make, it's not going to go anywhere. You can fill it up with a whole bunch of really cool hooks and stuff like that and make it like appealing to people. But that only, get, that's, that only gets you a little bit of traction and a little bit of play. You have to be willing, and again, my opinion, you have to be willing to take the time to be able to infuse it with all the necessary ingredients that it needs to be able to resonate. And the only way that you can do that, the only way that you know is when it resonates with you. Like to me, that's always been the gauge. If I feel good listening to this or it does something to me, it doesn't have to be, you know, I, I can't even put my finger on what it is. At the end of the night, like on certain records, I just want to listen to songs over and over and over and over and over again. And I'd be sitting there going, why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I listening to this song over and over and over again? It's got something in it. It's resonating with me. It's filling me up with something. It's reminding me of what my purpose in life is, why I do this, you know, like that's, that's what I, I've always lived for as a person in my position. And that's what I'm trying to do every time I produce a record with an artist. And frankly, there's no timetable for that sort of thing. You can't, this is, this is not a predictive, repeatable thing. The only thing that's predictive and repeatable is that you've got an, art, an artist, you've got a producer, you've got an engineer, you've got a studio, you've got instruments, you've got songs, you know, and all the other, you know, things that you need to be able to manifest that. Let's go make it work. <laughs> that's the, those are the repeatable parts. Everything else is like in the ether. It's yeah. ephemeral magic stuff. You know, Every, everyone's I've heard this story once before that at Geffen uh, at the end, you know, probably when he was looking to sell the company, he had like a McKinsey, uh, you know, consultant come in to like sit with the record label. And he was in on an A&R meeting and uh, they were talking about how Peter Gabriel is going to miss putting out his record that year and it's going to push into the next year. And 
not much we can do about it. We got to give him his space. And this McKinsey guy was like, I don't understand this. Someone should get on the phone right now with Peter Gabriel and tell him he's got to write these songs immediately. We need this record out this year. And it's like, that kind of sums it up perfectly is to have like a McKinsey consultant inside of an A&R department saying that about one of the greatest artists on the planet. <laughs> yeah. So, well, but, but I share what we got right now. Yeah. <laughs> true. I, sh- I, 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 true. I share your philosophy on this. Did you ever feel like in your career? Um, Cause I, you know, I felt like you kind of maybe had a little bit of a reputation as a taskmaster that kind of intimidated bands a little bit because you're thorough and, exacting and we're going to get this right oh yeah did that cost you work oh god yeah absolutely i mean that you know going back to what you were commenting on before i mean certainly with soundgarden there was no way that i was ever going to work with them again after that record i mean i think that they they thought i'm pretty certain that they were going to get something that they did other than what they wound up with you know i think that their initial thought was to kind of make a really quick record and go out and tour it you know, my <laughs> my feeling about that <laughs> is somewhat different. <laughs> How long did that record take? Um, comparatively speaking, not that bad. It was about four months. Wait, no, it was about five to six months, soup to nuts. Um, pre-production, two months. Recorded total recording time was a little under four. Hmm. Um, not. It wasn't bad, you know, but like when we first started working together, they sent me a cassette tape with a whole bunch of stuff on it and I listened to it and I was like, this isn't a record, you know? I mean, there were a lot of jams on it and a couple, like maybe six, seven finished songs, but I only heard about four things on there that I thought were record worthy. And I, and I was in the unenviable position of having to tell them this. And they weren't happy about it, you know, but, you know, at the, at that point in their careers, Soundgarden were the band that everyone was like, these are going to be, this is the next Metallica. This is the next big artist that's going to break. You remember when people, people knew who was going to be the next big yes. band to like, to, you know, like no one, no one can do that now. But back then it was like, there was a very steady trajectory that you could, you could see, you know, so you just all you had to do is apply the right elements to the situation and boom you were going to get the result that you wanted and the 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 desirable result in that case was to ensure that this band had a great great record something that was going to last them for as long as they needed it to you know but yeah i i i absolutely developed that reputation over time i mean it wasn't something i think after a while, I think it, it became something that was more that I kind of egotistically embraced, um, much to my discredit. Um, and I think that the, I think that that aspect of it definitely cost me work. I mean, I was n- not even headstrong. I think I, I definitely developed kind of an arrogance about it. And I think that made me a very difficult candidate to work with after a while. So yeah, I think that that definitely played a really tremendous role into into not getting work and stuff. Hmm. I appreciate your transparency there. So, but I know we kind of all get reputations as we go down the road. Uh, tr- some are fable and some are true. So um, yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's, but, I, I think there's nothing wrong with facing up to that kind of stuff. It doesn't hurt to do it, and it's it's actually I, I think it's the most healthy road to go forward. Well, if I'm hiring a producer, you know, there's a result you want from it. I don't want them to become necessarily the band's friend. Um, it's, oh. it's not what we're doing here. So <laughs> can you agree with that? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you know, and it, it's it's a shame because there's so many there's so many um, projects that are essentially continuances of these long-standing friendships that happen between an artist and a producer, just because there's a comfort level. It's fun to be for everyone to be for the family to be back in the studio again, but you're really not as the outs, the person outside of the relationship, who's just part of the audience, you know, you can, you can love the band, but you're not seeing any artistic growth. You know, you're not seeing the progress that really, that, that is ideal 
for an artist. And I, and I feel like the friendship, that's where the friendship aspect really kind of, it, it's very, it, it's kind of selfish on the part of the people who are in that relationship because they're really squelching the, uh, the, the development uh, and the growth of and the, the and the growth of the of the artist, which is really that's the that's the reason why we're all here. That's the reason why the record company is paying for us to be in the studio. Like, I didn't I didn't try to not make friends with people I was working with, but I, I made it very clear to them that I was there to serve a very very specific task, and whether whether it seemed like I was in service to them or not, that's really what I was. I was in service to them. And that I would do anything and everything possible to be able to get them the best, the, the results that were in parity with what their idea of what their record was going to be. Mm. And no one can fault you if the record became a commercial success. It's like, what'd you want? You wanted to play clubs the rest of your life? What was the other, <laughs> what other result would you want from this? So, yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I got, I certainly, I certainly got faulted by people for, for doing that. But at, at that point, it didn't matter because I could just sit back and go, you can complain all you want, but your record's a success and you're going to make an awful lot of money and people will are going to love your music and they're going to come out to see you and you're going to be able to support your families and you're going to be able to live the kind of life you want. So if it makes you feel better, you can dogpile me all you want. <laughs> It definitely is going to give you the space to continue pursuing your creativity, right? So. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and as long as everyone's happy in the long run, that's, to me, that's what matters the most. So tell me, you wrote a book, speaking of creativity, um, and, you know, you've been at this now for nearly four decades. Um, there's, you must have methods to kind of sustaining your creativity and keeping yourself engaged um, and pushing yourself forward. So the book is called Unlocking Creativity, correct? That's right, yeah. Um, and you have a theory in there, something around sensory connectivity. Is that kind of one of the main themes in this book? Um, that's a good way to put it. And yeah, absolutely. I mean... Tell me about it. Well, it's based on, I guess, anyone's experience with their own intuition. You know, intuition is essentially in my mind anyway, it's the primary tool. It's, it, it's something that we've all got, first of all. I mean, we can all sense things. And I just became aware that, I, I mean, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a dumb guy or anything like that, but you know, I, I don't really use my, I, I, don't, I don't tend to use my, my logical brain for an excessive amount of stuff when I'm doing this kind of work. I'm really, I'm relying on something completely different. It's essentially comes down to an intuition or how I feel about stuff. And if you, if you really start paying attention to that, it can be very subtle, but you can also get, you can also start realizing that it can be very compelling as well. And following that can be, it can, it can seem to be counterintuitive sometimes, but that's always because it doesn't follow, that message is not matching up with your own kind of sense of, of what you would, of how you would prefer things to be going, you know, which is usually more, in, in my experience, it's usually more of what the ego is telling you than anything else. Those are two completely different perspectives. Um, but I found that, and you can actually see, you can actually how find this reflected in certain kinds of somatic therapy that feeling really kind of matches up with sensations in your body, you know? So if we're going to, if we're going to short circuit the whole thing, when you listen to a piece of music and it feels right, you get a certain sensation from listening to it. And if it feels wrong, you get, a, you get other kinds of sensations. Now, when you're, when you're working as a producer and you're, you're paying attention to specific aspects of that music, you're, you, you, you come into contact with this as well. And you can, you, you basic, or at least I use this sensitivity to really kind of judge how things are working in an arrangement, you know, with a, with a hi-hat <laughs> or something like that, you know, and it's 
it's just a different kind of uh, barometric system, I guess, you know, than kind of trying to logically parse everything out, you know, and, and, and work according to kind of like a, a, a formulaic template, which I, I think I find that a lot of people do. Um, I've never done that just because it's impossible for me. I can't, it, it basically, it goes against everything that I'm oriented towards. And, you know, so I, I, I shared this kind of, this, this perspective on things. And it, it's funny because <clears throat> I've talked to people who've read this, you know, who've read the book and, and we're, and are still kind of like going like, God, I can't believe, I can't believe this. This is, this is amazing. You're absolutely right. When I'm listening to a mix, I'm really feeling something and I can tell where in my body it is, what it, you know, what it is that I'm feeling. So you, you just become used to these sensations and kind of, and, and used to kind of to, to expecting them because if you just open and kind of unconscious, it kind of, it just shows up just like an intuition about everything else. Like if you come around a person that you, that you feel an affinity for that affinity is a sensation, right? And if you don't like someone, same thing happens. You know, it's, 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 it's fascinating. I mean, there's a lot more in the book than just that, but that, that's definitely kind of like, that's a cornerstone. Right. And what else do you kind of attribute to your ability to keep kind of being in this creative space? I mean, do you still write a lot? Do you songwrite a lot? Do you not? Is that not part of your daily creative life? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I like the process of doing this so much. I'm, I, I'm, I enjoy honestly sitting, listening to other people's music, which I think many people find so incredibly tedious. <laughs> and, you know, I have to be honest, like not all, not all of it's very good. In fact, um, some of what I, I have to listen to is absolutely dreadful, you know, and for an A&R person, I think that was that's been probably one of the biggest curses of, of of the job, having to listen to like boxes and boxes of cassettes, just feeling your soul getting sapped out of your body, <laughs> listening to this dreadful music. Like, how and why would people would someone actually spend the time recording this, let alone performing it and wanting me to hear it and thinking that it was actually worth their time or my time or anyone's time? And you know, I feel like I'm going, I, I'm in hell. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's different <laughs> all right <laughs> oh i think i can understand your feelings slightly. yeah but, to, but 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 it's different because the context of this is different see i i don't experience it the same way i mean granted if i'm listening to a piece of music that's bad enough there's definitely a sense that the world is kind of like slowing down <laughs> and yeah that my flesh is sort of gradually being pulled off of my body but um neither here nor there uh, <laughs> no but like i i have no attachment to this music whatsoever my career is not going to be based on whether i've made a right decision signing it my you know my life as a producer is not going to be altered irrevocably if i commit to it and say i'm going to produce this record even though this music is absolutely god awful like all i have to do is sit there and listen to it and figure out what's wrong with it i mean Obviously, that can be a very, very general statement. When, when something's that bad, the concept of wrong is so all-encompassing that after a while you're kind of like, nah, I, I'm, I'm simply not going to get involved in this. But usually I get stuff that's mediocre, potentially veering into like, okay. And it takes me to um, one of my favorite lines in uh, that movie, All That Jazz. You know that one, the one about Bob I Fosse? I do, yep. Oh, what a great movie. Mm. So he's having an affair with this dancer and she's she's just not that good, you know? And he's, he's really hard on her and he takes her aside. And she's just, you know, falling apart, and he, you know, because she wants to be something that she's not. And he says, I can't make you a great dancer, but I can make you a better dancer. And I just, I love that. I love that because that's the position I'm in right now. I'm not trying to make anyone great. Um, and I, that's fine because 
helping people get from a place where they're in a state of mediocrity. And it's essentially not even because they're bad. It's just because they don't have any reference point. There's no, nothing referential around them that they can take and say, okay, this is this, my star to steer by. It's more like, I don't know what to do with this. I can't go forward. I can't go backwards. I have no direction. I'm stuck. Help. You know, being able to provide some kind of insight to take something that's, you know, probably not that good and take it and bring it to a place where it's okay, maybe even good. Um, and also we're surprised, surprised you actually find the person's voice in there so that they're able to listen to it and go, this is something I can be proud of. It's not a, and it's not a monumental achievement you know, like, like making super unknown or something like that. But, you know, I, I went through a phase where I was like, for so long, like, that's what I should be doing. You know, I, I, I want to be back and, you know, making records like that again. It's like, mm, that's not repeatable. I had to acknowledge the fact that those moments like Super Unknown, like Mechanical Animals, like those Chili Peppers records, those are, they're just, they're moments in time. It's, that's the beauty of it. They're kind of, they're there, we managed to preserve them. To try and go back and repeat that, you know, to, to even think, to even have the, the I guess, the, the, the pretense of thinking like, you know, the, I want that again, that kind of, you know, because, it, because it's really all about feeding your ego at that point, isn't it? It's not about like what's you know what I what, what what kind of service I can do, you know what I what kind of value I can bring to a situation. It's basically about I want to feel good again because I want to have people adulating me for the, you know, for working on these high profile records and getting paid ass loads of money to do it. It's like I don't think that works now, you know. It, this is incredibly fulfilling, and it's also addressing a sector of community of artists that can't and won't be addressed in any other way, you know, for people who actually are very deserving and worthy and, and should be given, at least given the opportunity, if they're never going to put what they're doing out at all, to be able to look at and go, I did something substantial that I love and I can be happy with. For someone as talented as you are and to have been involved with so many records that you know, to this day are evergreen records, you know, 20 years later. Um, you know, why can't a Michael Beinhorn work with Dua Lipa or with The Weeknd or, you know what I mean? Because some of that music's mm -hmm. good. You know, the, some of that music is good. So, but why is a guy that's as talented as you not having those opportunities? I think that's, I don't know. I think that's a shame too. It, it, it is what it is. I mean, let's put it this way. If, if those opportunities come up and it seems like the right thing to do, there's no reason to say no to it. Yeah. You know, I agree with that, but I think what you're doing now too, in a way is look, you're going to discover someone really great early and you know, the labels don't, you know, they've kind of seeded that from their mandate. Um, <laughs> yeah. So eventually you're kind of, you're going to maybe find someone again, who's like, a, it becomes that, you know what I mean? But you're coming in so early and you might be back into that world. So through that, I'm, through a different path, that. you know? There's, so yeah, exactly. There's the, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. I mean, I'm also involved in the philanthropic endeavor. What's that? I have a very good friend who works at a corporation called Randstad. She started thinking about all the people that are facing hunger and really dire situations from COVID. Uh, you know, I mean, this, I think this could be the first time that we, you know, since the Great Depression, or pr probably even worse than that, that we're dealing with poverty or that we're going to deal with poverty and hunger and famine, actually, at the levels that we're, that we're going to see. And we started talking about creating a, um, an entertainment-based initiative to do this, which would involve having uh, famous singer-songwriters contribute a piece of their music, like a, real, a, a very well-known piece of music, have an author write a story, a short story narrative around that song, and then having the singer, the original singer, narrate the story and connect and bring that together with a piece of artwork. And uh, 
Randstad have signed on for it. They're $39 billion company. So <laughs> that's a massive amount of, of corporate firepower right there. Because this is all going to be money raised directly for food banks around the world. Of course. Why not? That's awesome. Yeah, man. And t- unfortunately, timely. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. If we can do something about it, I mean, it's, it's, it's all the better. It's just a shame that it had to get to these to these ridiculously epic proportions. It could have been avoided, but you know. Yeah, yeah, leadership. Um, yeah. So listen, then Michael, I can't, like I wanna thank you for doing this. I wanna value your time here and uh, we'll wrap this up. Um, and I like could do this with you forever. So you're welcome back I anytime. Know, this is fun. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm gonna make you co-host one of these with me one day when we have somebody you want to talk to and we'll do this. So um that'd be great, man. I love it. I- I'm just happy that we have the opportunity to speak again. Yeah. It's been so long. It's nice to see your smiling face. Same. I say the same, the same, the same. Thank you so yeah. much and stay healthy. Hey everybody, thanks for listening this week. To follow what's going on with this podcast, you can go to theradicalpod.com, theradicalpod.com. You'll find show notes and past episodes and uh, even a little swag there if you want a t-shirt or a hat. I would be honored if you'd subscribe at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Till next week. 